Prime Minister Imran Khan, welcome to the program. Thank you. So tell me first and foremost, what message do you want to send from here? What do you hope your visit will have accomplished? Look, Christian, I wouldn't have come to uh, the UNGA because, you know, we have ju just emerging, coming out of a very difficult economic situation. Uh, and so my presence is required in Pakistan. But what has, what has happened in Kashmir uh, is so alarming. And uh, I realize that the world doesn't fully understand what's happening there. And what is happening is can only get worse. Eight million people have been locked inside now for 50 odd days. And the world doesn't seem to understand the gravity of the situation. Because the moment the curfew is lifted, there are 900,000 troops there. And I fear a massacre. Indian troops. Indian troops. And I fear there's going to be a massacre. Because, uh, you know, the pe people in Kashmir for the last 30 years have been demanding the right of self-determination. There have been demonstrations. Last five years, ever since Narendra Modi's government came, uh, the level of uh, oppression has increased. Uh, there have they've been United Nations reports on, on the human rights abuses. You hear the United Nations, both you and Prime Minister Modi are addressing the world. There is a UN resolution that governs the fate of Kashmir. Do you have any hope that might you meet with the Prime Minister of India bilaterally or a pull aside or whatever you do, even if it's not a thousand percent formal? There is no question of me meeting Prime Minister Modi of what he's done in Kashmir. This is only a mindset which believes in Hindu superiority, which does not believe that other human beings, other minorities, <clears throat> other religions, are equal citizens. Only that mindset could have done this. I mean, how could anyone do this to other human beings? Shut them up for over 50 days. What does he expect? Even animals, if they're shut inside for 50 days, no hospitals, no schools for them, even then the world would have reacted. Why do you think the world is not reacting? Remember when Putin went into Crimea and annexed Crimea, there were sanctions, there was an international uproar that frankly continues to this day. Why do you think the same has not happened when Modi has essentially, potentially annexed uh, Kashmir? Well, I've apprised almost all the top world leaders. I've explained to them the situation. There are 11 United Nations Security Council resolutions which gave the Kashmiris the right of self-determination and that it's a disputed territory. It's not an Indian territory. First of all, a lot of uh, leaders didn't realize this. But I think uh, the, even the ones who realize, look upon India as a market for 1.2 billion people and trade and so on. And this is the sad thing, material over the human. And you said that the world appears to be appeasing India. Let's just get one thing right. Narendra Modi represents RSS. He's a life member. RSS was this ideology which came about in 1925, inspired by Adolf Hitler and Nazism. They believed in the ethnic cleansing of Muslims from India. This ideology had A, the idea of Hindu supremacy, and B, hatred against the Muslims. They considered themselves the Aryan race. So this racial uh, superiority ideology, it was responsible for the assassination of uh, Mahatma Gandhi, who they believed was soft on Muslims. It was banned three times in, in India as a terrorist organization. These extremists have taken over India. Now, he is a very good friend and ally of President Trump. And President Trump, in fact, speaks warmly of both of you. And he says that he's had great meetings with you and great meetings with Narendra Modi. And he is willing and able to help and intervene if you should want. President Trump, head of the most powerful country in the world, he's best placed to do something about this. At the moment, he's saying, Narendra Modi, I want to help, but... Modi doesn't want it. Why doesn't Modi want it? Because the moment this becomes internationalized, other countries come in and mediate, they will realize that the poor Kashmiris were denied the right for self-determination. And they will know what the human rights abuses are, which are going on in Kashmir. It's massive security forces which have locked in these people. So Narendra Modi does not want any outside uh, uh, people to mediate. He keeps saying it's a bilateral issue. When we try to talk to him, he says, 
It's a, it's a unilateral issue. So we go around in circles. But eventually, and this is my belief, and this is what I think I've achieved from my trip here, I believe that the international community will move in. They will have to because this is going to become a flashpoint. And of course, for people outside, and maybe even for you all inside, everybody's very aware that you're both nuclear powers, that there have been wars fought between you over this very issue in the past, and they're concerned that this might, as you say, become a flashpoint, but a terrible flashpoint. What can you say about what would your reaction be? How far are you prepared to go? Christian, that's why I'm here. If it was just something which would have remained localized between India and Pakistan, even if a conventional war, the world is not really pushed about it. But this can go out of control, and I'll tell you how. What uh, the narrative of uh, Narendra Modi's government is, that the Kashmiris actually want this. This whole thing has been done to make Kashmir prosperous and develop. And Pakistan is the spanner in the works by sending in terrorists. They're already accusing us that, I think, defense... They are saying it again, the, Min the military chief, that 500 camps are being used and no. Pakistan is mobilizing militants in Kashmir, terrorism. This was predictable. Why are they saying it? Because uh, they want to divert the world's attention from what is going to be a massacre. So to divert the attention, this is the mantra that it's Islamic terrorism. And Islamic terrorism since 9-11 has meant that the world just looks the other way you can violate all the human rights. You can do anything of those people by calling them Islamic terrorists. That's what India has done, Narendra Modi. My point is, what is Pakistan going to get out of this by sending in 500 terrorists? There are 900, almost a million troops there. What are they going to do there? Only thing they will do is that they, on the pretext of going after terrorists, there would be more oppression of the people of Kashmir. And secondly, they will divert the world attention towards Pakistan. And so I, bef I have specifically told Pakistan, people of Pakistan, anyone going into Kashmir will be an enemy of Pakistan and enemy of Kashmiris, for the reasons I've just told you. This is the first time two nuclear-armed countries are face to face. The, if this goes like it happened in February, I mean, we immediately returned the pilot when we shot down the plane because we didn't want any escalation. And I, actually the world thought that you had behaved very responsibly in pulling back from that. Break. And I told the Indian public also, I said, look, if this goes further, it will soon spiral out of control beyond my hands and your prime ministers. And guess what, you know, Narendra Modi, once we returned the pilot, his entire election campaign was that Pakistan is so scared of me that they immediately returned the pilot and I'm going to teach Pakistan a lesson. And this was a trailer. The film is about to start. The whole election campaign was this jingoism, this whipping up hysteria, war hysteria against Pakistan, and he swept the elections. In six years, India has changed. And I fear it is going to change even more rapidly. That's why I call it appeasement, because the world should take a stand. You do not, in this day and age, put 8 million people in an open jail, surround them by 900,000 troops. There are also other huge flashpoints going on, even uh, uh, around your neighborhood, and that is the tension now between Iran, the United States, Saudi Arabia, and the countries over there. You met President Trump. I think he asked you to do what you could in mediating maybe with Iran. I don't know. And you met the president of Iran as well. What can you tell us about any behind-the-doors diplomacy, behind-the-scenes movement in that regard? Well, firstly, uh, Christian, it's so important that this conflict does not take place. Because apart from anything else, I mean, we already have Afghanistan on one side, this Indian problem on the other side. Last thing we want is a conflict on the other border in Iran um, and, and, and U.S. and possibly Saudi Arabia, UAE. It'll be a nightmare for us. We are coming out of this very difficult situation where we had a massive current account deficit, and we're just getting ourselves right. If the oil prices again shoot up, I mean, not only us, it's going to affect so many countries in the world, probably cause more poverty, and God knows how long it will go, because, you know, so dangerous when people say that, you know, it will only be a short war. To be fair to President Trump, all his instinct is against the war. Yeah. I know there are people pushing him. I feel this will be awful once it starts. So. We should do everything to stop it. And I'm trying my best. I spoke to President Rouhani. Uh, and yet, let's see how it develops.
at the beginning you were talking about the dire financial straits that Pakistan has been in, that you really should be there because you've got a major economic crisis which you're trying to fix. Um, you were against an IMF intervention or IMF assistance and then you accepted it. Why have you decided that going for the IMF is a better course of action? Christian, we inherited the biggest current account deficit in our history. It was such a huge gap that until we fixed our, um, increased our exports, uh, curtailed our imports, there was a time lag. <clears throat> in that time lag, we had to uh, service our debts. We had to service $10 billion worth of uh, uh, debts which had been accumulated by the previous government. Well, how are we going to do it unless we didn't go to the IMF? Uh, we, they, we could have defaulted. They could have been run on the rupee. Uh, you know, and the economy could have tanked completely. So we've gone through a difficult period and uh, mercifully, thank God, our exchange rate has stabilized. We lost 35% value in, on our currency, which of course caused inflation, which has hurt our people. But at least now we are stable and the signs are exports are in, uh, increasing now. The economy is on the men, uh, country stabilized. So it's a great opportunity now to build on this. Now, we have campaigned for anti-corruption. We, we come into power. So when some, the problem, this is where the problem starts. Now we are trying to collect taxes because we have to collect taxes, to, you know, to service our debts. And Pakistan was famously unable to collect taxes. Yeah. I mean, for years, people weren't paying taxes. So the last two months we have been, by uh, the reforms we did, we have collected record taxes the last two months. Now the problem is, the reason why, well, well, the reason why people uh, pay taxes and we feel people will pay more and more taxes because they trust the government. It's a credible government. I think successive American presidents and successive partners have wished that Pakistan would, you know, realize that its, its biggest threat was from Afghanistan and an unstable border with Afghanistan. Can you say that Pakistan is no longer in the throes of that kind of militantism? that has turned off your international partners for so many years? Well, first of all, Pakistan was not responsible for the U.S. not succeeding in Afghanistan because there were 150,000 NATO troops, the biggest military machine ever. And we are, we are being blamed from them not winning in Afghanistan. And we were always told that the problem is North Waziristan. That's the ha haven for all the terrorists and so on. If the problem was North Waziristan, the U.S. should have succeeded in Afghanistan. In fact, it, the things are even worse now than before. So clearly the problem lay with a history of Afghanistan. They, they have always stood up against uh, anyone invading their country. I mean, there was history with Soviets, then with British before that. The, I just felt that the U.S. trying to find a military solu solution in Afghanistan when there never was one. And finally, sense has prevailed that now this dialogue, dialogue has started, in, uh, supported by Pakistan, and I feel really sad that in the middle it was uh, scuttled. But I do feel, and we are trying, and I, when I spoke to President Trump, we are trying to again get the talks back on. Because, as I repeat, I repeat, there is no military solution. Imran Khan, thank you very much indeed for joining me. Thank you.